All right. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so we're going to go through a little bit more of a technical talk um, with me. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the journey that the research community did in multi-object tracking. Um, so this is an AI symposium, right? So we're going to talk about how we went from handcrafting solutions all the way to trying to make our models end-to-end -end learnable. So let's get started. So first, uh, let me introduce the, the task. So the task is multi-object tracking. We have these types of scenes in which our goal is to detect and track all the objects in a scene. Um, so we can see all types of scenes where there's pedestrians walking around, um, maybe even autonomous driving scenes where you can see a lot of cars, a lot of pedestrians. And we want to be able to understand this dynamic world around us. Um, so, more technically, the problem statement is that we actually need to go ahead, take an image, and understand which part of the image depicts the same object. For example, here we can see three pedestrians that we're interested in tracking. We need to understand, first of all, where are these pedestrians in the image, so the detection part, and then in two images, three, four, five, in a video sequence, how do these pedestrians, these objects, correspond to each other in order to form a trajectory in time? And we often use detectors as starting point, and this is kind of a recurrent theme of this talk, that we're going to rely heavily on detectors, and this is something that we want to kind of get rid of. So one might ask, um, why do we actually need tracking? So we do rely a lot on detection, um, and so one of the goals of tracking is to actually help when detection fails, right? When we have, for example, occlusions. In the scenes that you have seen before, it's pretty common to have uh, pedestrians occluding pedestrians or pedestrians going behind a pole, going behind a car. And we still want to be able to reason about where these pedestrians are in this scene. Um, of course, we also then have problems of uh, viewpoint, pose changes, illumination changes that cause detection to fail. And we have, of course, problems, for example, like background clutter. But I think the most interesting um, goal of tracking is to actually allow us to reason about the dynamic world, right? So the world is not only consisting of still images, but we actually have videos, we actually have dynamic objects in our scene, and we want to be able to do, for example, prediction, right? So you can imagine an autonomous vehicle that is driving in a street, and you're detecting a pedestrian on the side. You want to be able to understand whether this pedestrian is going to cross the street or is going to continue walking uh, down the sidewalk. And you can imagine that this is really core technology for applications like autonomous driving, for AR, VR, where you want to be able to interact uh, with the real world, uh, and of course, for robot navigation. So um, today, I want to go through uh, a little bit the uh, different paradigms that we have been using in multiple object tracking from a scientific point of view, and how they evolved, uh, starting by tracking by detection, which you might have heard of is you know, the classic paradigm for tracking, moving on to a more modern tracking by regression and tracking by attention paradigms. And in this talk, we're going to move um, from completely separate detection and tracking towards unifying both tasks and also towards end-to-end -to -end learning, right? So we're going to use more and more AI as we go forward in the talk, and we're going to understand how to build an end-to-end -end trainable tracker. Uh, but there's kind of a, of a surprise at the end, uh, and that is that we actually go back to tracking by detection, and we study, you know, with all that we have learned uh, in machine learning and AI, how can we make that paradigm, which is super simple, how can we make it really strong, and how can we make it better even than end-to-end -end trainable paradigms? So let's delve right into it. So. Um, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about a lot about these type of sequences and why I'm showing you these sequences is uh, because we started around 2015 um, by trying to track these type of sequences. So, you know, seven, nine pedestrians in the scene. Um, there was a pole in the middle, which was the biggest difficulty of this scene. And then techniques and data set evolved uh, 
uh, we presented this data set to the community in 2016, and by now, methods have evolved to be able to deal with these type of really crazy scenarios where we have hundreds of pedestrians in the scene, heavy occlusion, even to annotate these sequences, this becomes a super challenging task. And so you can see the evolution uh, that the community made, right? Like from considering these type of sequences challenging to going all the way and being able to track a couple hundred of pedestrians at the same time. So let's see how, how did we make this happen. So let's start by the super simple tracking by detection. So in tracking by detection, we're going to break the task into two parts. We're going to say, look, the image is too big. Like, I don't even know which objects I'm going to track. So I'm going to rely on a detector. I'm going to apply, for example, a pedestrian detector. This is not going to be perfect. We're going to have some errors depicted here in yellow. And the idea is that in the second step, which is the date association, I need to associate my detections in the temporal domain. And this association is what's going to create my trajectories. Now, of course, all the errors that happen in the detection step are carried over to the data association. This is kind of the, the challenge that we need to deal with. So let's build a super simple online tracker. Right? Let's start in the first frame. We have the track initialization. We start with our detector. And we want to track these three objects that we detect in the scene. What we do in the second frame is we can do several things. Like, if we have been tracking this object for a while, we can make a quite good prediction of where it is going to be in the next frame. If not, simply what you're going to do is you're going to assume that the pedestrian didn't move. And then you're going to apply another detector to the next frame. And so now what you find yourself with is two sets of boxes that you have to match. You have to perform this date association that I was talking about before. And you have to actually match these two sets of boxes. Now, the matching step is um, the really fun one. Um, with respect to the, the motion model, I mean, one can use classic things like Kalman filter. Nowadays, we might use a recurrent architecture. But to be honest, if you have simple scenes and you have a high enough frame rate, usually a constant velocity model is what works best. So we're not going to talk about it too much um, about the motion model. What is really interesting, though, is the matching step, right? The association between these two sets of detections, the detections that I had at the first frame and the detections at the second frame. So what you want to do is you want to assign some sort of distance between these boxes, right? This could be simple intersection over union, could be pixel distance, 3D distance, appearance distance, whatever you want. It can be learned. It can be handcrafted. But at the end of the day, you're going to put these similarities into a matrix, and you're going to solve an optimization problem. You're basically going to say, what is the most likely match given these distances? So the optimization problem is not uh, a real issue. The question is, what do you really put into these matrices? And so let me present a little bit of a historic view of um, how tracking, or let's say, what the scientific community was, focus on, was focusing on as uh, we evolved, first, when we presented the benchmark, this was around end of 2014, beginning of 2015, people were focusing a lot on motion models, making more and more complex motion models, starting from physics-based motion models and evolving all the way to learn-based motion models. Soon enough, though, um, people started working on more complex features, right? Um, CNNs appeared, and, and they, they hit hard the computer vision community. And so people started learning stronger appearance models, for example. And finally, people started working on more complex optimization problems, right? Instead of solving for two frames, we started uh, solving the problem for a bunch of frames, super complex optimization problems, up to a point where it took, for example, three days to find the trajectories in a sequence of 100 frames. So it really didn't make much sense, to be honest. But it's, of course, it gave better accuracy, as you can see here. Um, so the idea is that um, 
we're going to go a little bit um, through the date association, right? So you can see the matching that I've presented with the Hungarian method as the most basic date association. But I think the most interesting thing is to start moving away from this separation between tracking and uh, detection. And so one of the first, um, one of the ways to do this is actually to say, okay, um, we know what the advantages of tracking by detection are, right? Um, we know that we can leverage well um, the advances in object detection, right? So better object detectors, better trackers. We can use this paradigm on, on, online with the Hungarian method. We can use it by batches with a more complex optimization. Uh, we're even working on learning-based solutions with graph neural networks. This is all great. But how do I move forward into something that can be learned, right? And here the problem is that we still need detections as starting point. So if I now want to train everything end-to-end, -end, this is not possible because I've broken um, the task of tracking into two parts, into detection and data association. Nonetheless, um, detections are a really strong point for tracking, right? So one of the things we thought for unifying these two tasks is how about we start from a detector and we convert it also into a tracker. And this is how the paradigm of tracking by regression appeared. So if you remember, which is now probably ancient history, um, trackers like Fast and Faster RCNN, which appeared and made a big splash in the computer vision community, um, how they essentially worked is you had your input image, you pass it through your favorite backbone, and you obtain a feature representation of that image. You then say, OK, I'm interested in actually analyzing this part of the image, right? We had an network that was telling us all the regions of interest that we could find in the image, all the regions that could potentially uh, represent an object. And so I can go into my feature representation and exactly pinpoint the representation, the features for this part of the image. I would then, um, I can do many things with this feature representation, right? I can classify it. I can say this is a person, this is a car, this is a dog. Uh, but the most interesting thing from a tracking point of view was the actual goal of what is called the regression head. So the regression head was created in detection just to improve accuracy. And how this worked is you had your region proposal that, you know, maybe instead of being perfectly located tight around the object was, you know, a little bit off. And what this regression head did is it regressed the coordinates of this bounding box so that it would actually tightly fit the object um, once these coordinates were regressed. And so this is a really interesting behavior, right? For, for the detection community, this was just let's improve accuracy because better locator bounding boxes, better accuracy and precision. For us, though, um, it represents a really interesting behavior that you can move a box that is around the object to a box that really tightly fits the object in that frame. And why is that? Is because um, this is exactly what we want to do when we do tracking, right? And in particular, if we're talking about online tracking, meaning frame-to-frame -frame tracking, I'm going to have an object that moves slightly from one frame to the next, and so you can think that the bounding box is just moving a little bit from frame to frame, which is actually exactly what this regression head is capable of doing. So let's see how we could actually repurpose this head uh, for tracking. And um, for this, we presented tracker, Tractor, which was essentially a method trained as a detector, but with tracking capabilities. So how this works is, let's assume that you are at frame t plus 1. You have already tracked these objects for a while. And you're going to use the detections of the previous frame as your region proposals. right? So these detections are not exactly located where the object is, because the object, of course, has moved a little bit. But they are really around this object. And now what you can do is you can feed this into your regression head and obtain really well-located bounding boxes. 
Now, this is really cool, right? Because before I had this, you know, this matching, this Hungarian, how do I define these distances? And here, I really didn't do anything, right? I just took my detector, which is perfectly well-trained, I plug it in, and suddenly I obtain trajectories. Now, the question is, are you really doing tracking? Are you really solving the tracking task, right? And for this, we need to ask ourselves the question, um, where did the detection with ID1, for example, the red detection, where did it go in the next frame? Am I able to answer this question? If I'm able to answer this question, then it means that I'm able to solve the tracking task. And indeed, I do know that this red box was the region proposal that was used to generate the red box in the next frame. So I can assume some sort of association here. I can just link these two boxes and say, this is a trajectory. And so effectively, I have solved the tracking task with this super simple method without training anything, just repurposing my detector. So um, of course, it's a super simple tracker, right? So, so there are pros and cons into this tracker. Um, the main pro is that we don't need to really train any model. We can just reuse a really well-trained regressor. We get really well-positioned bounding boxes. Um, the other pro is that we can actually train our model on still images. Since it's a detector, we can train it on still images. So if we need to build, for example, a cell tracking method, um, I can just annotate single images of cells. And now suddenly, I also have tracking capabilities. So this is really cool in terms of actually scaling up and reusing your annotation smartly. And the other pro is that um, Tractor is online, means that it can be used for real-time applications, like, for example, robot navigation or uh, AR, VR, autonomous driving, etc. Now, let's go a little bit through the cons. Now, the most important thing for me is that this model has no real notion of identity, right? So we haven't really done a proper analysis of this is a person, how is this person dressed, how is this person moving, and making sense of whether the two persons that I'm seeing in the two frames are really the same, right? My detector is just regressing to the person that is closer um, to the current position of the bounding box. So it does get a little bit confusing crowded spaces. And also, as any online tracker, if the track is killed, for example, the object becomes occluded, it's really hard to recover. And finally, the regressor only shifts the box uh, by a small quantity, because this is how um, detector regressors are trained, and training them for shifting by a larger quantity uh, makes the training really unstable. And so when you have large camera motions or when you have large displacements due to low frame rates, this is not going to work. Now, of course, in the community, we already had methods um, that we can put on top, like the motion models that I mentioned, or the appearance models, um, like re-identification, which can be used to actually alleviate a little bit of these problems. Um, but this gets a little bit ugly, right? So I'm trying to go to an end-to-end -end learning solution. I present a really simple solution, and now I have to put these kind of models on top to actually deal with the real problems in tracking. This is ideally not what I want to do. But nonetheless, tracking by regression made a bit splash in the community. Um, we had bounding box regression with tractor. We had center point regression with center track. Um, and the idea here was that spatial cues took over appearance cues, right? So we didn't have this, this, um, this notion of identity. We didn't have any appearance model. And spatial was kind of all that you needed. And so in the historic view that I presented at the beginning, um, tracking by regression methods appear as these um, stars. And so you can see really how they pushed accuracy, which I plot here in the y-axis. You can see how they really pushed accuracy and how many methods followed up and then built on top of tracking by regression methods. So this was really great, right? This was um, really a step towards unifying detection and tracking. But we still had these problems that, in practice, we needed re-identification methods or motion models on top to deal with the really hard tracking problems. And so 
we started thinking about better ways of unifying detection and tracking, really having one model that would go from image to trajectories. And maybe unsurprisingly, um, we are going to try to tackle this with attention or with transformers. Right? So this is, this is the, the era of transformers. Everyone is doing everything with transformers. Why not doing tracking, too? And so still inspired by, um, by tracking by detection, we're going to uh, propose the paradigm of tracking by attention, in which attention or transformers are going to joint, jointly solve the detection and the tracking task. And Again, inspired by tracking by detection, we're going to start from a transformer-based detector. And the idea is, can we extend its capabilities also into tracking? Um, so some of you might be familiar with DETER. Um, this was a, a detector presented now around three years ago uh, in which they pose object detection as a set prediction problem. And the beautiful thing about this work was that it was really clean. Like before, detection methods required you know, quite some tricky um, things. After the, the detection was performed, you need to clean your detections. You had, for example, three detections overlapping one object, and you needed to decide which of these three is actually representing the object. This all went away with Tether. And so essentially what they did is was um, they used you know, your favorite backbone to extract your image features. And then the magic happens into the, what they call the transformer encoder and the transformer decoder. So the encoder is simply taking in the image information and processing it properly for the transformer decoder. But I think the really cool thing is what happens on the decoder side. Right? So on the decoder side, you have a transformer that takes in a series of object queries. And object queries are simply random vectors here. And this transformer takes the object queries and the image information and outputs directly bounding boxes with their class. So this is really cool, right? Because inside this transformer decoder, you have the communication that you need in order to output the right number of bounding boxes, in order not to have two bounding boxes explaining the same region and the same object. So this is a really clean solution to the problem. And so the question was, how can we extend this to the tracking problem? And so we proposed um, TrackFormer, which essentially posed multi-object tracking as a frame-by-frame -frame set prediction problem. Right? So at each frame, you're going to predict a set of bounding boxes. And the only difference with data is that now these bounding boxes should contain identity information. They cannot just be a set of bounding boxes, but they need to contain a link with the previous set of bounding boxes in the previous frame. So let's see how this works. So we start with, uh, we start with data, exact same idea. Uh, we encode the image features, and we have a decoder that takes object queries and transforms them into bounding boxes. So in this case, we have found three objects in the scene, three bounding boxes. And now we go into the next frame. Now, of course, in the next frame, what we would like is to somehow transfer this information, this notion of identity, of the three bounding boxes that we found in the first frame. Right? So these three bounding bro boxes, red, green, and blue, we want to be able to find them again in the next frame and still give them the colors red, green, and blue, and not just some random colors for some randomly detected boxes. And so what we proposed to do was something super simple, um, and is to introduce this concept of track queries. So track queries are essentially like object queries. They are still random vectors. But in this case, they have already some information in there. They actually represent some identities. And this is why they are color-coded. And the idea is that whenever the red track query decodes a box, we're going to assign it the red identity. And so, of course, if you have a new object, like for example in this case that appears in the scene, the purple object, you still have an object query that can decode it. But the other three track queries, the ones that are color-coded, are going to be able to perform the tracking for you 
and decode the same boxes from frame to frame. And of course, this goes on uh, frame by frame. You just propagate the track queries, you include more object queries in case new objects appear, and you keep decoding objects. And of course, it's super simple if, for example, an object disappears from the scene. Like, for example, the blue object in the last frame disappeared from the scene. And simply what happens is that the blue track query doesn't decode any bounding box. This means that the object disappeared from the scene. So all the cases that we have in tracking, you know, entering trajectories, leaving trajectories, association, they are all handled by the transformer decoder. And so let's see a little bit more, maybe in detail, um, the architecture. Uh, but I what I want to point out here is actually how attention is going to be used to solve the, the different tracking challenges. So the encoder is the same as all transformer encoders for any task that you can find out there. Um, it encodes the image features. And the decoder takes this concatenation of object and track queries. These are simply concatenated passes them through a series of um, self and encoder decoder attention, and finally maps these queries into box and class predictions using simple MLPs. And so the interesting thing that I want to focus on is actually the attention. How can we use the self and encoder decoder attention for the tracking task? Um, so let's look at the two types of attention we have self-attention between queries, and we have encoder-decoder attention. Now, intuitively, the self-attention between queries is used to initialize a new track. And why is that? So self-attention between queries means that all the queries are talking to each other, which means that the track queries that already have an identity here can talk to the object queries and say, look, the purple object, it doesn't really belong to us. Like, none of us was following the purple object, right? And then the object query can say, OK, I will just start a new track with this purple object. So there needs to be this communication between track queries and object queries so that the objects are not confused and that each track query goes to the right object and the object queries are used to start new objects. The same reasoning for terminating an occluding track. Right? You need to communicate with each other to see potentially how the object might have been occluded. And the second type of attention, the encoder-decoder attention, right? this is the one that is used to fuse the image information into the decoder. This, of course, is used to find new objects in the new frame, but also to adjust to the change position of the tracks, right? because the, um, the track queries do have some sort of spatial bias, right? So they like, for example, the red query is going to like to, um, to decode boxes in the bottom left part of the image, right? There, there is this spatial bias built into the track queries. And this spatial bias needs to be adjusted as the object is moving. And this, of course, can be used with uh, the image information that comes from the encoder. Now, one big question in tracking, um, and that was something that, for example, Tractor was not able to do, was recovering from occlusions, right? We needed this extra re-identification head or motion model head, this extra model that would deal with these cases. And ideally, we would like Trackformer to do this on its own. And so, in order to recover from occlusions, we really don't need to do much, right? We just need to take our track queries and keep them active for a period of time. Right? So imagine the blue track query that keeps searching for the blue object. You just keep trying to decode this blue object for a number of frames. If the blue object reappears, the track query is going to be able to redetect it and assign a bounding box with a blue color to it. So it's really, really natural and easy um, to deal with this tracking challenge. There's no need for an extra re-ID head, but of course, nothing is perfect. Before, I've talked about the spatial information, uh, the spatial bias, which is embedded into the track query. And this means that, as I said before, the red track query likes to um, decode bounding boxes on the bottom left part of the image. If suddenly the red pedestrian appears on the top right part of the image, the track query is not going to be able to decode it. 
right? So for really long occlusions, for really large motions, this typically doesn't work. Um, so we like to show tons of experiments in our paper. I'm not going to go through this, but I do want to point out to one super important line here. And this is um, that actually, you know, until um, track former and transformer based trackers, we used to use the training set of mod challenge, validate on the validation set, and test on the test set. Really simple, everything was within the benchmark. As soon as transformers appeared, we had to start using other data sets. For example, in our case, we pre train on a really large scale data set for detection, which is called Crowd Human. And without this, you can see that we're losing basically almost all identification capabilities. So here I'm plotting two metrics. The first one, MOTA, is the accuracy of tracking. The second one is IDF1, is the capability of keeping identities correctly. And you can see that we lose 10 points, which is really, really a huge number. And this indicates actually how crucial data is for transformers, right? So this is really great. The model is really beautiful. I really like it. It's super clean. You don't need extra heads. You don't need anything else. But you need data, right? There's no surprise here. Transformers like data. And so this was a challenge back in the day to actually get enough data to train this tracker. And so um, while this was a super elegant formulation of tracking, it really merged detection and data association. It had really good performance with partial occlusions. It had good performance where detectors are weak, because now the detection and the tracking tasks are completely bind together. It had really state-of-the-art results with, again, some, some extra data and with some extra tricks. It's not really easy to train uh, transformers. Um, and of course, there were like similar concurrent papers. You know, everyone was getting on board with transformers for tracking, so there were um, similar concurrent papers. So this is great, but of course, you know, every technology has a dark side, and the dark side is that training such a model, first of all, is not really straightforward, and you require really a lot of data. And so this was the, the main challenge that we had was, where do we get this data? How do we train this model? And it's also unclear how this model generalizes, right? So for example, not seeing any more challenge data hurts performance significantly, which means the model is really bound to the data that it's actually looking at. So while the end-to-end -end learning model was great, it had um, these, these problems, which are really general problems in end-to-end -end learning methods, right? I'm not, I'm not discovering anything new here. Um, and so, you know, once we reached this point, we were like, okay, this is great, but I cannot deploy this into my autonomous car, right? This is not going to generalize to diverse uh, weather conditions. This is not going to generalize to diverse objects. And so we started looking back at the technology that we had, and we started looking for a tracker that really generalized to diverse tracking conditions. A tracker that did not require vast amounts of training data, right? Some tracker that is lightweight and that I can deploy fast. And surprise, surprise, um, we went back to the beginning. We went back to tracking by detection. And now the question is, OK, we have learned a lot along the way. There's a lot of new machine learning techniques that have been presented. The field has really advanced. How can I use all this knowledge to make tracking by detection better? And can actually tracking by detection be a more general, a simpler, uh, a better tracker than the end-to-end -end learning models? And so we went back to the simple online tracker that I presented at the beginning. And we figure out the problem with this tracker. And the problem is this part here, the definition of these distances. Now, we used to do this in a heuristical way, you know, intersection over union, 3D distance. And the question is, can I put all this machine learning um, knowledge, can I put it in here and make the task of defining distances easier? If I can do this, then maybe tracking can be done 
with tracking by detection and with this paradigm. And so essentially what we proposed was a super simple tracker. And the only thing we did was look at the data and pay attention to the details. So how can I actually improve every part of the pipeline? Um, so here I'm going to have at the top uh, what we call the motion head. So um, here I have any type of linear motion um, that, I wanna, that I wanna put in there. I could put a learned motion, but we had just constant velocity assumption, which worked great. And we had a memory bank for treating active and inactive tracks differently. So the idea is that an active track is the track that you, is the pedestrian that you're seeing at every frame. An inactive one is an object that goes through an occlusion and you're trying to find it anywhere in the image to see if it reappears. At the bottom, we had the appearance head, so the head that is going to analyze the appearance of the object and potentially um, train a CNN to decide which object is similar to each other object. And finally, we would fuse this information and have the track update with the Hungarian. And we found out that there were actually three important parts where we need to pay attention to. The first one is how do we train this CNN for appearance comparison? The second one is how we treat these active and inactive tracks. And the third one is how do we fuse all this information? Like when is motion information important? When is appearance information important for tracking? And so we created the super simple ghost tracker. Um, and the order of the words in the acronym doesn't change the result. And so we called it GHOST. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details. So today, I just want to talk about one of these details that we focus on and to show really the importance of this tiny little change in the model. And this is in actually how we train the CNN for comparing appearances between objects. So um, how this is typically done is um, you take your CNN. This is typically a Siamese neural network. You train it to compare bounding boxes. And you train it with these re-identification data sets. These are data sets built specifically for this purpose. They show pedestrians from different viewpoints, different illuminations. And so the idea is that you build a really robust model that can compare bounding boxes, whether these are cars or pedestrians or any object, it can just compare the appearance and say, this is the same object or this is not the same object. Now, people have been using this since forever. Like, these data sets are really, really old. Um, and they have been using them for multi-object tracking. But no one really went through and analyzed if this was really a good data set for re-identification in multi-object tracking. And it turns out the data distributions in these re-ID data sets and in these tracking data sets are completely different. And so if you plot the methods um, on the x-axis, we have plotted rank one, which is a re-ID metric, right? The higher, the better. And on the y-axis, I've plotted the mod metric, the tracking metric. And here again, the higher, the better. And so we ended up at a point where we see that all the best re-identification models, right? These are years and years of research in re-identification, great performance in re-ID. They actually perform really poorly for tracking, right? And ideally, what we would want to be is somewhere in this region, right? Where we don't really care too much about the re-ID metric, and we care more about the tracking metric. Right? So how can this model really help tracking and not help re-ID, which was the task that it was trained to do? And so the solution is actually super simple. And it's one of the most uh, well-known domain adaptation techniques in the community, which is just that you know, if my data statistics are different in training and testing, one thing that I can do is, for example, reweight the batch normalization layers, right? So a lot of architectures have these batch normalization layers. And it is really a known technique that you can reweight them, based them on the data that you're seeing at test time. The question, though, is um, what kind of measures do I use for reweighting, right? And we did something super simple. Just take the mean and variance of the features of the detections 
in my current frame, right? So if I want to do tracking in my current frame, I just take the statistics of this current frame, and I use these statistics to reweight the batch normalization layers. So this is super simple, but this is all the change that we need in our tracker to make it super robust to illumination changes, pose changes, um, dealing with different types of objects. So we train on people, and we can track cars. We can track any type of object. And this is essentially what made our simple online tracker work. Right? So we have a frame-by-frame -frame tracker. It is super fast. You can use it for real-time applications, for your AV, for your robot navigation. The coolest thing, in my opinion, is that we didn't train on any tracking sequence, zero. I use zero tracking sequences for training, and we generalize to four benchmarks. So this is, I think, a really um, cool result, because we just went back to the very simple tracker that we've been working on for years. We look at the technology that we had in machine learning in AI. We adapted it, and we made this tracker much stronger. And of course, it has the benefit of old trackers, that it's um, super simple, but the benefit of new trackers, that it's really strong, some numbers, this we need to have for the paper, right? Um, but it actually, the, the cool thing is that it, it really works well. And when we try it also on, on NVIDIA data, all kinds of challenges, this worked out of the box, which is actually super nice. So OK, I've presented, um, I started with tracking by detection. You can do online tracking. You can do online uh, graph tracking, more complex optimization. Uh, but you always have this dependence on detection. So we just follow the flow of trying to create this really big end-to-end -end, um, trainable method. We show how we could turn a detector into a tracker, thereby combining uh, both tasks. We show how to further merge detection and tracking with an end-to-end -end solution based on transformers. And the cool thing here was that we didn't need any tricks to deal uh, with tracking solutions, uh, with the tracking challenges. And finally, though, we show that sometimes it's better to go back to the basics and really check, you know, um, create a really simple tracker that with just a few details, if you pay attention to a few details, it can still you know, be state of the art. And so um, I just want to conclude with a few remarks. So first of all, I think it's really important that you get familiar with your data. right? So um, now we're in the era of big data, but this doesn't mean that only the models are taking advantage of the big data. This means that you also need to get familiar with big data. You need to have really clean data, really curated data. Nowadays, there are a lot of data sets out there. Uh, but if you are ever looking to create a new data set, you really need to pay attention to what data you're using. Um, also, going back to the roots sometimes is, uh, is important. Um, so in our case, for example, we found that strong rate identification maybe is all you need for tracking. Uh, but I'm still not giving up on TrackFormer, right? So I am aware that we're not really ready towards uh, a tracking foundational model. We really need more data. Annotating tracking data is expensive. If you think like how much detection data, how much segmentation data is out there for single images, now you have to blow this up into the temporal domain. So this really explodes. So we need to really explore auto-labeling methods, uh, we need to explore better ways of obtaining labels. Uh, but I'm still not giving up on creating a tracking foundational model you know, based on some sort of transformer that can really leverage huge amounts of data. So with this, uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Yes, we have time for one question, and we have one right here in the front. So, oh, oh, sorry. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
That thank you great. so much. <laughs> so my name is Paulina, and thank you for the talk and this whole journey that we actually uh, could experience with you. And my question is about the moment when you decided that you will not develop anymore this new fancy solution, but you will go back. Because I think it's difficult to say to yourself, okay, I have to stop and uh, take the uh, step back. So how does it look like and what are the advices for researchers, young researchers, uh, that will actually be in a similar situation, that they will find out that the place that they took, the path that they took, is maybe not the best for now? Uh, that, that's a really good question, right? Then it depends a little bit on your situation. So all of this work was done while I was a professor at TUM. The resources that we had at TUM are not the same as the resources that we have at NVIDIA. So if you're looking to you know, train this huge model with 1,000 GPUs, forget about it, right? So um, at that point, you have to get a little bit more creative, right? And you have to really look at your problem and look at the challenges that you're currently having, right? So we essentially saw that um, we were in need of a solution that didn't require such big amounts of data to train because it was simply not working, right? So I feel like a lot of the problems that Trackformer has is because it hasn't seen enough data with those type of challenges, right? And we did augmentations, we did pre-training, but this was really not enough. And so by just looking at the actual challenges that you need to solve, at some point we realized that it was better to just focus on a, maybe a smaller model that would deal with only those challenges, right? Rather than you know, trying to create this big model that we didn't have data for, we didn't have resources to train. So I think this was a realization of, you know, at the moment, what is the best that I can do with what I'm given, right? Now I'm thinking more about, let's create this foundational model, right? Because the circumstances have changed. But I think there's value in both solutions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura.